full of life and ready to go, right? So yeah. thanks for being here today. You're welcome. Welcome. My honor, my pleasure, and my privilege, too. Really, all of the words above. So hi, everyone. My name is Salika Rotska. I'm actually a graduate from Cal State Fullerton. I graduated from the College of Business in 2008. I double majored in finance and economics. And then while working in finance, I got a job straight out of college working for Raytheon, big defense industry company. And really quickly realized I don't have the personality for finance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too upbeat. But it was a great training experience to go through all areas of finance in a big corporation, learn how to deal with all these different personality types. And one of the things I've always, I've, I was a president scholar here at Cal State Fullerton, so I had a Fulbright scholarship, mm -hmm. and it's part of a, like an actual scholarship association and group. And so one of the things that I did is I served on the screening committee for all of the incoming president mm -hmm. scholars for the past, since 2006, actually. So I've interviewed over 300 applicants already. We, we usually interview about 50 a year, so closer to 500, actually. And that's how I actually met Elizabeth Zavala. We first met way back when we were both really just starting off and got to know each other. We were catching up for coffee with coffee because I love coffee. And uh, as I was talking to her about what I'm doing, how I got to where I'm going, and I'll, I'll cover a little bit of that as I go through. And then so she had talked about, well, would you like to come and talk at the Career Center? I'm like, yes, of course, always. I love coming back, I love giving back. And, it's one of those things I've learned with all the different, on my journey towards where I want my success to be, and as I meet more and more very successful people, the one key thing that all truly successful people do is they give back. And so, love being able to come and help. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about winning the mental game of interviews. Now, how many of you guys have walked into an interview before, and you've just like completely froze and think like, oh, and gee, like, what am I doing here? Right, yes. Now, how would you like, though, instead, to walk in and feel completely confident? To walk out and feel, I owned it. You know, to, to be able to project, because you know deep inside that you got this, right? But sometimes you can't project it. How would you like to be able to show on the outside what you know on the inside, right? Now, what if I told you there's actually research-backed methods in which you can, things you can do, techniques you can take, that will actually drastically improve your chance of getting and winning the interview, getting the job after the interview. Would you guys be interested in hearing that? Yes. All right, okay, hold on, hold on. It was like, uh. Would you guys be interested in hearing that? Yes. Yeah, there you go, there you go. One of, one of the reasons I really like participation is our bodies and our brains, it's, we're all, we're logic, emotion, and feeling. So we're all of that, so you need to like, get all of that in there, get really hyped and excited for it because that's how you can go. Oh, ha ha, I'm clicking there and not here. That's how you go from that. Boom, to super excited, I rocked it, I'm awesome. There you go. <laughs> now, so what I'm gonna talk about and what you're gonna discover is one of the main reasons why regular interview prep doesn't work. I mean, it's great, it's amazing, but there's a, another component, there's a deeper reason to all of the steps in interview prep, and that's the part that most people aren't learning, and that's the part where you're sabotaging yourself. It's, I'll go into that. So we're gonna talk about what's that pre-prep step that you need to take. What do you need to do before you even do that? And to trick your brain into being more uh, confident and also to have that power technique. So why is this important? I mean, we know we want to get on the job and that's why interviews are important. But how hard is it to land a job? Well, if you're gonna be working for corporate America, eh, eh, that would be the next stop. But if you're gonna be working for corporate America, on average, um, every corporate job opening has about 250 applicants. Of those, only four to six of them actually get calling for an interview. That's a 2% probability that you are the one called for that interview. And so when you're in that interview, you wanna rock that interview because there's only one position. And guess what? Ah. 33% of the bosses say that within the first 90 seconds of the interview, they already know, am I gonna hire you or not? 90 seconds, that first impression. They haven't even really gotten to know you as a person, but they already know, they can tell, they can feel. And that's one thing at Raytheon especially, when I would interview there, when we'd bring in the different people and I'd talk to the get executives, they'd say, first minute or so, they could feel, they could know, is this person qualified, do we want this person or not? 
And so that's why it's so important to understand the pre part of that. And then also in the Gallup poll, he said that 51% of the people who are currently employed, like they got a job, they're being paid, they have benefits. They said they're gonna be looking for a new job within the next year. So when you're out there interviewing, you're not competing just with anyone who's just finishing school, you're competing with half of the workforce. And that's why this is important. That's why, so that way you wanna see what can you do, boom. What can you do to increase your chances? You have that limited time to make that first impression. What can you do to really make it? So, are you ready to find out? Yes. 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 Hold on, hold on. All right, I like that move. Are you ready to find out? Yeah. yeah. Woo! Love it. Love, love, love it. Yes. Okay, so just a little bit about me. Funny story about my very first interview. Now, we, the, inter the word interview is a very loaded word to us, and so I'm going to tell you about my very first interview so you guys realize just how loaded that word is. Got to the table, big group of people. They asked me a question, I responded, and I was super enthusiastic and spoke really, really fast. And they laughed, and they're like, huh, you speak really fast. So then I went in the corner and cried. I was five, but that was an interview. That is an interview. An interview is merely us speaking to people. We look at interviews and we think of, you know, us cowering in a corner with a whole bunch of people looking at you and looking down at you. No, reframe exactly what you think about an interview. Since then, I've gotten a lot better at interviews, you guys, a lot better. Um, although Subway didn't agree. I applied right out of high school. The first job I ever applied to was Subway. Now keep in mind, I was a straight A student. I was involved in like multiple like sports, after school activities. I mean, I got over $30,000 worth of scholarship money when I went to college. Like, I did pretty good in interviews. Subway didn't want me. And I'm like, I'm your ideal client. I mean, your ideal, like, employee, what in the world? But it's okay. It's all right. And so, one thing, though, that I've learned while doing the interviews, while serving on the interview committee over the past 10, 11 years, and one of the things also, when I left the corporate world and launched my own business, so currently I'm a leadership and performance, mental performance coach, especially for women who work in management positions like corporate America. And so one of the big things I learned is the mental game. It's all the mental game. You're, most of you guys are probably overqualified. Most of you are definitely qualified. It's that mental game of preparation for the interview. And that's what I want you guys to really focus on. Ah, next, 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 perfect. And so, and one of the things I realized for me, for example, in my line of work, every time I speak to a potential client, that's an interview for me. That person is interviewing me, determining, do I wanna hire you? Do I think you can do the job? Should I invest my money into you? And the hard part for me is, I don't know what the job requirements are because that person doesn't know their own job requirements. Right? Most people when they're hiring coaches, they don't really know what they're expecting. They don't know what the job requirement is. So I am applying for a position in which the job requirements are not set. And I need to interview so confidently that they're like, oh, yes, 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 that's exactly what we want. But that's, those are interviews. Interviews can be conversations. And if you view, start viewing interviews as conversations, it changes the, uh, the game. And I remember one of the things that my mentors would do is they would, you know, when you have mock interviews, my mentors would step, pull me aside and say, okay, why should I hire you? Why should I hire you over the person who's had 30 years of experience in leadership training? And they'd ask me these questions to prepare me for when I'm actually gonna be interviewed by my clients. So let me go next. Oh, ha, huh, I forgot I put the slide in here. So that's me. I've come from a very large family, which probably is one of the reasons why I have such a very big personality. I'm from a family of 11 children. so. That's my 2008 graduation, traveling through Europe. This is one of my friend and mentors. She brokers the buying and selling of multi-million dollar businesses. Um, that's Jeff Hoffman, he's the co-founder of Priceline.com. And that was last month, I was in Silicon Valley doing uh, a speech there, but yeah, next. All right, so the usual interview prep. What do we usually do when we prep for interview? Usually they say research the company, which is good, you should research the company. Before I speak with potential clients, I look them up on social media. I find them on Facebook, on Instagram. If they have a Snapchat and I can find them on Snapchat, I look at what's their recent storyboard because I wanna know. I wanna be able to make that connection with them. So imagine 
And the reason why that's, I mean, that's really awesome. But imagine if you're gonna go meet for someone for the first time, or if you're going on a date with someone, right? You wanna know what that person likes because you wanna be able to appeal to that. You wanna show, hey, I know you. That's you know the whole aspect of researching the company. Then you review the job requirements and you say, am I skilled for that? Do I meet that? And that's great, an amazing, amazing tip. The research potential questions and what are your responses? Because you wanna be prepared, right? Amazing stuff. Plan what to wear, because what you wear has an impact. Um, when I was in Silicon Valley last month, um, one of the ladies in the audience was an executive chef, and she ran six different restaurants. And so she said she has, I mean, she has a 92% turnover rate in her employees, crazy. Um, and so she interviewed, she's always interviewing people. And she said the first thing she does is look at what they wear. Because in the food service industry, you're required to have closed-toed shoes. And if someone walks in without closed-toed shoes, she doesn't even bother her time. She just kicks them out, interview done. Because if she has to explain to them that they need closed-toed shoes, then she's like, they were gonna have way too much training, right? But what you wear has an impact. So you know when they talk about dress for the job you want, yeah, definitely, that's really important. You know, plan what to bring, show up early, pay attention to the nonverbal communication, and follow up. All of these amazing tips. But why are they amazing tips? Have you guys ever stopped to think the deeper why, like peel back that onion layer of why are these good? Why are people, why, I mean, any site you go to, any interview coach you talk to, this is what they'll talk about. They'll bring it up, and there's a deeper reason why. And the reason why is because it's training your subconscious mind. It is training your mind for that mental game of the interview to get, to sell yourself on you, basically. Because when you're going in an interview, you're selling yourself. Everything in life is a sell. Just because money doesn't exchange doesn't mean it's not a sell. When you're trying to convince someone to go on a date with you, you're selling yourself as a, I'm a fun person to go on a date with. Or, you know, if, if I'm here, me speaking to you guys is a sell. I am telling you guys, I have valuable information that would help you guys. And you guys need to buy into that before you accept this information. So everything is a sell. When you're on an interview, you're selling people on you. But if you're not sold on you, why should they buy into you? And all of this stuff is helping you sell yourself on you. It affects your mind. So that's why it's so important to know, okay then, how is it affecting my mind? Why should I be influencing my mind? Like, what in the world is going on? Like, really, what should I be thinking of? And this is why. The power of our mind. So when we think of communication, and interviews are communication. And I remember this, I first learned it I was at a conference and a lady was speaking and the FBI sometimes hires her when they do interviews and interrogations because she's just such a great body language reader. And she shared this to me and then afterwards I saw it like everywhere, the way things happen. 7% of our communication are the words that we speak. 38% is the tone that you use and then 55% is your body posture, your body language. But when you're in an interview and you're paying attention to what the person's saying, you're trying to process in your mind what I need to say, are you paying attention to your tone of voice? Are you paying attention to how you're sitting? Like right now, all of you guys, are you paying attention to how you're sitting, what your posture is like? No, because you're focused on something. Well, you are, awesome, see? There you go, woo, one in the room, yes. I mean, I am, I'm always very cognizant of what my posture is, especially when I'm speaking in public. So for most of us, 93% of our communication is being influenced by our subconscious mind. And if you are not sold on you, then 93% of your communication is saying, don't hire me, even though your words are saying, hire me. <coughs> I have a client who is manager in a big corporation. She's brilliant, she's smart. But what happens is whenever she gets into meetings, and especially with men who raise their voices, because she grew up, grew up in a very abusive um, family, her default, her subconscious mind says, men, loud voices, fear. So they'll ask her, are you sure that $3 million invoice is coming in next week? And her response will be, yes. How confidence inspiring is that? Because her subconscious mind, she's not aware of it, is influencing her tone, her body language. All is saying, I'm not confident, I'm scared. And they're not, they don't believe her until they see the sign. So that's what we're working with her, working to get her tone and her body language to line up. Because when 
every single aspect of your communication is aligned and lined up, then you're 100% sending the same message to your interviewers. And how amazing would that be? To be able to show up for an interview and not have to worry, am I sending the wrong messages? Because you know every single aspect of you, whether you're thinking about it or not, is sending that right message. And that's that important of that subconscious mind. And so, next. So to win the mental game of the interview, you need to understand your mind and you need it to get it to work to your advantage. And that's where understanding the mind comes in. And that's where the biggest portion of this, the rest of this speech, this presentation will be. Understanding your mind, understanding how it works, and the three very powerful techniques that you can start applying today, and one of them will actually practice today, that will make a big difference in your confidence and in your, especially your nonverbal communication. Because that, your verbal communications, it's easy, right? That's, that's the easier part to figure out. The nonverbal communication, making sure that's aligned while you're focusing on your verbal, that's the harder part. So that's the part that we're gonna focus on. All right, so the foundation. Absolutely everything that you are capable of, that you think you can achieve, and your potential, all of that is limited to what you believe. Henry Ford is credited for saying, if you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you're right. And the biggest example of this is up until, oh gosh, I forget what year it was, no human had ever run a mile faster than four minutes. So everyone thought it was physically impossible. They thought if you tried it, if you tried to beat that four minute mile, you would die. And so for decades and decades, no one beat that four minute mile until one person ran it, like I think a second or two seconds faster. And the next thing you knew, within the next year, six more people. Within the next year, more and more people. Now it's totally normal. Now high schoolers run a four minute mile or less. But because we had people believed you can't, you're gonna die if you do, that limited their ability to perform. I'm what's called an extreme focus coach. My coach, the one that I got trained underneath, he trains elite athletes. He trains NFL players, Olympians. Next month he'll be training some of the Olympians who are performing, who are gonna be competing in next year's Olympics. All of it, your mental performance is all what you believe. And that same applies when it comes to interviewing because it's all how deep down do you believe? So our brain, we have our conscious brain, and then we have our subconscious and unconscious brain. So when I say subconscious and unconscious, sometimes I'll say sub, sometimes I'll say unconscious. For the most part, assume it's one and the same. They're slightly different, but just a bit di um, but very close enough. Um, your conscious brain is everything that you're aware of. If you think of a computer, your conscious brain is like the keyboard and the monitor. You see data around you, you type it in. Like, you know, you're listening to me speak, you type in the notes or you write the notes, right? That's your conscious brain. Your subconscious brain is like the RAM. It's just all the processes that you have that are going through, you know, for any programs that are currently running, easy recall information, that's your subconscious brain. And then your unconscious brain is just the storehouse. It's like the hard drive on your computer. It stores absolutely everything you have. It just stores it. And this is what happens though. Our conscious brain, is responsible for only a small fraction of the decisions we make in a given day. Most of our decisions are made by our subconscious and unconscious brain. Because your subconscious and unconscious, what they assume, they don't know fact from fiction. It's whatever you feed it with your conscious brain, that is what they will accept as truth. It's just data, data in, data out. And so if you give them more of one piece of data, that is what they will accept as truth. And that's when, you know, sometimes, you know, when we have, uh, there's a certain event happens or a certain emotion happens, you know, we feel a certain emotion and it triggers a certain memory. We weren't conscious of that memory. It was somewhere stored in our subconscious or deep in our unconscious, but that memory got triggered. And the reason why this is important is because your belief of, do I deserve this job? Am I a good interviewer? Can I speak properly? I mean, English is my third language. You can't tell it now. But when I was learning English and I look at my parents, one of the big things my parents at my mom, she swears she can't speak English. She swears it. But I'm telling you, each time we're having a conversation in English and we don't want her to understand, she understands. She understands. What it is, is when she's under stress, her brain says, I can't speak English, so she doesn't understand anything. As long as the pressure and the tension's not on her, she can speak 
English, you can understand English perfectly fine. But it's your belief system. Your belief system is what trains you and what tells you what's possible or not possible. So that's why we really need to deep, deep dive into this because your conscious mind, so um, on average, in our day and age, we get hit with 16 hard drives worth of information every day. We have to process that much information every day. I mean, we have smartphones. Before smartphones, you could at least be away from data, but now you're, you're constantly being, you know, marketing, marketing, marketing. You scroll through Facebook, you can't do like one scroll without an ad, right? Marketing everywhere, stimulus, signals, everything. There's so much data that we get gets thrown at us and our conscious mind can't handle that. So what it is, is our subconscious mind and our unconscious mind, they're the ones that help you process all that data quicker and they, they look at habits. They look at, ooh, here's a new situation, storehouse of bank of information, how did we deal with it previously? Oh, okay, boom, that's how we're gonna react. Whether, log whether consciously you wanna act that way or not, like I told you, my client, whenever she was in a board meeting, she was consciously aware that she is confident, she knows what she's speaking about, but her brain, as soon as she heard the loud male voices, triggered that emotion, and the default reaction, whether she wanted to or not, was, how did we handle this in the past? Boom, this is what we're gonna do. And that, right there, big, big impact on our ability to interview. Um, and this is really big where I, Really want you guys to really think, what do I believe about my ability to land this job? If you are the first person in your family to go to college and to graduate, and this is the first time you're doing this, no one else in your family has done that, your default belief system could be, it's not possible. If you are the first person, I, I grew up, so in the culture that I grew up, I remember it was females, yeah, go to college, get a degree, it's cute, but you're gonna get married, have kids, it's good. Like, that's the culture I grew up in, right? So when I first started working within the corporate America, it took me a while to adjust a little, even though consciously, yes, I'm, like, I'm a very confident person, I'm a very talkative person, I was leading teams back in high school and in college, right? As soon as I got in corporate America, though, I had to realize that I had that limiting belief, so that way I could become a more confident leader with everyone else and with all my peers, especially the ones who are like two or three times older than me. And that's our subconscious mind. That's where your gut instinct comes. Everything your conscious mind has fed you, it's stored there and it's your default mode. So uh, I wanna say probably in the 90s, there was a professor at Harvard who started doing this study on the brain and mapping out the brain <coughs> and how, how does your brain act when you're consciously aware of something or if you're unconsciously aware of something. And he noticed that there's what he called the default mode network, which is when you're consciously aware of something, your brain, there's certain areas of your brain that light up that have activity. But when your brain goes into relax mode, when you're not consciously thinking of something, your brain's always processing. And so there's an another, uh, another processing stuff that happens. So he wanted to test it out. Does this happen just in adults? And he went back and he tested it into younger kids as well and found the same does not happen for kids who are less than nine years old. Your default network, your default mode network, your conscious and your subconscious mind, all of the programming you have there, that's first put into your brain in the first seven to nine years of life. So the things you grew up seeing, the patterns you saw growing up, the neighborhood you grew up in, the education you got, what you saw in your family, that is why that is so powerful. How many of you guys have once interacted with someone and either they said, oh my gosh, you sound exactly like your mom or you sound exactly like your dad. And you're like, oh wow, that's right, I do, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, totally, had, I totally had that moment. I, I felt like a complete mom because I have siblings who are significantly less, you know, like younger than me and so I would help them through high school and I remember once, one of them really frustrated me and so I yelled something at her and I'm like, oh, I just became my mom, oh my gosh, right? But it's because those are the patterns. You're not aware that you've stored them in you, but those are the patterns you have in you. And that's why it's so important to realize the patterns, because you can't fix something, you can't fix a problem if you don't know that the problem's there, right? You can't. You need to be aware that the problem is there in order to be able to fix it. And so, and this is the, the key thing, your self-worth, your confidence, your beliefs about your abilities, your beliefs about 
do I deserve this? That goes deep down into your unconscious, and that's how you need to fix it deep, deep, deep down to be able to do that. And one of the things especially is, um, do I deserve this? That question. And also, am I really qualified or am I an imposter? Those two things, everyone faces them, but females especially. Females especially, I mean, there's an entire movement um, about I am enough and about imposter syndrome, where you have so many females, they'll get into upper management position and they'll feel it's only a matter of time before people find out maybe I'm not qualified. Imposter syndrome, we have that. We, all of us struggle with that because what happens is when you move into a new position where you've never experienced before, your default pattern, your de what, what's comfortable to you in your brain, that's what you're, you're going back towards even though this is the new you. In a really interesting Harvard study that they did, they found that people would rather be brilliant and excellent at sucking and being miserable if that is the pattern that they knew, then to try something new and potentially be happy. Because our brain craves patterns, craves habits. That is, that's, that's what our brain is. It's just a whole bunch of habits that have been created and formed, the synapses that have been formed since you're young. And so any belief system that you have, especially the further deep down it is rooted, the more, the harder it will be to uncover it and to move it out because that's how deep down it is rooted in you. So. So how can you change it though? So we know this, right? Like, okay, I get it, I get it. How do you change it? And that's the brilliant part. You change it by repeatedly training your brain otherwise. That's why all the interview prep stuff, what is that interview prep stuff? It's training your brain to be confident. It is training yourself to say, I've got this, I am qualified for this job. It is selling yourself on you, but deep, deep down, like truly deep down. So most people though, when they do the interview prep, they go through the motions. So now let's say if you're, you know, you're gonna be body, you know, bodybuilding, there you go, bodybuilding, right? And so if you're gonna go and just, you know, go through the motions of lifting weights, blah, 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 you're not gonna see the results because you're not doing them properly. But you're, you're going through the motions, you're doing the deed, you're doing the actions, right? But if you know, why should I, who's the bicep curl? Yeah, why should I, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna tell I do not uh, lift weights often. But, you know, why, you know, What's the proper way of doing this bicep curl? What is it affect, how is it affecting my muscle? Then you can train much smarter. And that's the same thing with the interview prep. Once you know the way your brain works and why the interview prep steps are the way they are, then you know how to train better. Because if not, it's like, it's like trying to lose weight. So like, let's say you wanna lose weight. And so you go and you exercise, right? You wanna get a, land a great in a job, so you go and you do the prep for the interview. But then, if you go straight back into your way of thinking of, I suck, I don't, I'm not qualified for this job, I'm scared, I don't think I'm good enough, that's like the equivalent of right after you're eating exercise, eating a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. You won't see the results. And you'll be frustrated saying, I'm working it out, I'm going through the steps, but I'm not seeing the results. Why? Because you still have junk that you're dealing with and you need to clear that junk. So, one more quote before. And this is really, really true. What you repeatedly think Hear and see of yourself is what your subconscious brain believes of yourself. And so if you want to truly want to change it, and I'm just gonna give one more example, and this example is from a dear friend of mine. Um, he grew up in a family of very smart kids. And so all his older siblings, and he went to the same school as his older siblings, they were brilliant. He wasn't as brilliant as them. You know, he wasn't straight A. So all his teachers were just like, why aren't you as smart as your, kid, as your family? Why aren't you as smart as them? And all of a sudden, the message he was getting is, you're not smart. You're not smart. And he started believing it. He started believing that he is not smart. So what happens? On tests, on stuff, his subconscious brain was saying, you're not smart. So he started sabotaging himself without realizing it. And before you knew it, he was in danger of failing. He went through most of his educational career thinking he's dumb. And then something changed. He started reading new books, started interacting with different people. And now when he goes and he speaks at conferences, people are like, you're so smart. Same guy, same IQ, but it's your belief system. That's why whenever we talk about self-fulfilling prophecies, that's why they're so powerful because it's your brain. It triggers what you have in your brain. And that's the pattern that you grow up and you, you live for.
All right. So now one thing I want to do is I want to talk about what are common <coughs> fears about interviews because you can't fix a problem if you don't know you have one. You can't fix a problem if you don't haven't identified it. So I've put in some things about interviews. So like fear of the unknown. Like I don't know. Is it going to be hot? Is it going to be cold? Am I wearing the right clothes? You know, what questions are they going to ask? And the fear that you won't know what, how, what to answer, which really is the fear of looking stupid in front of people. One of the, the biggest, biggest fear, our, our greatest fear isn't fear of death or stuff. Our greatest fear is failing in front of other people. There's a guy named Napoleon Hill. At the turn of the century, Andrew Carnegie commissioned him, who Andrew Carnegie by these days would have been considered multi-billionaire, like one of the richest men on earth. He commissioned him and he said, hey, look, I'm gonna give you letters of introduction to all of the wealthiest and most successful people here in the United States you know, in the early 1900s. He goes, you go interview them. And then you do everything that you know, everything that you've researched, put that into books and start writing books about it, you know, like start teaching it. So that's what Andrew Car uh, Napoleon Hill did. For 20 years, he interviewed Thomas Edison, he Henry Ford. He just like everyone that he could think to interview. And he found the biggest fear people had was the fear of failing in other people's eyes. That's why when people fear public speaking, it's not public speaking per se that they fear, it's the fear that people will see them as looking stupid. So that's one of the big fear we have when we go to interviews. Am I gonna look stupid? Are they gonna respect me? Am, is what I have worthwhile to say? That's one of the biggest fears. And that's why, because of that fear, one of the biggest regrets people have when they die is that they didn't live life on their terms. And instead they lived life for what other people wanted them to live. And then there's fear that you make a bad first impression. Fear of stuttering. Any other fears? Does anyone else have any other fears that maybe you don't want to share? But if you do, you know, any other fears or common fears? You might not have had this fear. It was a friend who had this fear of <laughs> interviews. <laughs> any fears of interviews? Like anybody else? I know this. I mean, I think the really the biggest one is: Will I look stupid? Will I look like I, I want to? I want them to know that I'm I'm capable, right? So that's those are common fears and. Boom, 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 yes. So, before I do that. No, actually I will, I will. We'll do that. Ooh, that did not turn out the way I wanted it to. It looks much better on my smaller screen. Uh -huh. That is an armadillo. Like I mentioned, so I'm what's called an extreme life, um, extreme focus coach. And so my coach, what he does is whenever he talks with his athletes about any of these principles, he always has them rooted. Because it's one thing to hear information, but our brain is like, this is, the, this is the best way I've seen people, um, someone uh, describe it. Every single day, if you look at your brain and pretend it's like a, a reel, you get just reel of information, you get tons of data every single day, and that's grass. Data, 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 grass, grass, grass. And then when you get a story, it's like a tree. So when you look back through your memories, you notice the trees more than you notice the grass. Data, you'll forget. Most people forget a presentation within the next three hours. True. But if you tell a story, the retention rate is much higher. And so what he's done, he's tested out where he, he anchors everything with an animal, and he found that his training material now has a 92% retention rate. So everything I just talked about, we're anchoring it in the armadillos. We call them Mima and Lima because we have two, because you have your conscious and your subconscious mind, and because mind mastery is life mastery. And this is what happens. So the armadillos, the three-banded armadillo, more specifically, whenever it's being attacked, by predators, it can curl up into a ball, into a shell, and its hard protective shell protects it. It's just like this ball of, it's like Pokemon. Um, <laughs> it's just this protective shell. So whenever you, know it now, knowing the power of your subconscious mind and the power of whatever data you bring in influences your subconscious mind, whenever you have negative thoughts coming in, whenever you're listening to negative information, be like the armadillo. You create that shell, you close off your mind to it, and anything will, else will deflect. And now, the really important part about this is, you guys, we are influenced literally by everything, and especially the news. Facebook, a few years back, did a study where they showed that peop the emotional impact of a Facebook post can last up to two, two to three days. And especially in this political climate, every Facebook post is very emotionally charged. You know, imagine, this, this study was done before the political climate, imagine more so now. I actually just stop listening to anything political. If there's anyone who posts a lot of political stuff, I just unfollow them for now. Because I'm building up a business. I have a launch for 
an online leadership training program going on. I have like a whole bunch of affiliate workers that I'm working with. I don't have time for negativity. If I want negativity, I can, I can create negativity in my head like that, right? We can all easily create negativity. I don't have time to listen to anybody else's negativity. And especially as we go further, I'll talk to you the, the impact and the power of words has on our physical body structure. So be Mima Lima, be the armadillo. Be careful what news sources you listen to. Be careful who you're speaking to. If you're in a group of people and all you guys are doing is complaining about the interview process or complaining about this, stop. Stop, because what you're doing is you're influencing your subconscious brain to think negative and to think it's not possible. It, so it sounds like, that's too, like, that's too easy, right? It really, really has a tremendous impact on us, much more so than we can ever think or we can even realize. So be really careful, be that armadillo. Create that hard shell. Now the other thing about armadillos is when they're under attack, if let's say you know they can't curl up in a shell and they're near a body of water, they have two options. They can choose to let all the air out and walk into the water and then sink down to the bottom and crawl through the mud to the other side. Or they can, they can choose to inflate to breathe in air, it actually inflates their intestines and it gives them their uh, buoyancy that helps them be able to float on the water. Now let's think about that with us. When, when negative forces attack, if you allow it to deflate you and you have to go through the mud, that's tough. But if you're careful and you realize, okay, I'm not gonna fill myself with negativity, instead I'm gonna fill myself with, with good forces, with positive influencing forces, then you can float away. And then, I mean, would you rather go through the mud or would you rather float on the water? That's up to you to decide. And that's whether you deflate or inflate. And that's Lima Lima. So that's just something really quick to think. Protect, I can either deflate or I can inflate myself. <coughs> Lima Lima, the power of that subconscious mind for that. Um, so, and then, all right, so that's good. Now, into the practical steps. Okay, what can I actually do? What can I inflate? What can I bring into me that will help me. The first is words. Words are powerful beyond measure, and here's why. And so this is Dr. Imani Soto. Um, yeah, I keep mispronouncing his, his name, but I believe him. Masaru Imoto. Masaru Imoto, thank you, thank you. I'm like, I, yeah. Um, so what he did, starting in the 1900s, 1990s, 1994 is when he published his first book, he did a series of experiments on the impact of words on water. So what he did is he took glasses of water, and on some glasses he wrote words like love, or I will kill you. On other words, he wrote hate or grief. On others, he wrote thank you or you fool. And then he let them stay like that for a while. Then he froze the water and took a picture. And this is the impact they had on the water crystals. The written word. If you look at words like love and thank you, words that have the positive, encouraging vibe. It was very well crystallized, very expansive, geometrically very beautiful. And if you look at words like you fool or I will kill you, disorganized, chaos. I mean that one at least has like a little bit of a shape on you fool, right? But I will kill you, look at that. That's the physical impact on water of words and we are 70% water. Unless you're not drinking water then you're probably 65. But <laughs> But our body is made up mostly of water. Our, youth, our world is made up mostly of water. And that's the impact of words on water. He retested this again with a spoken word, same results. And he also retested this with music and got pretty interesting results. He found that classical music tends to have the same reaction as like thank you and love. Heavy rock metal music, that had more of the I will kill you feel to it. And then pop music was just sort of like, somewhere in between, like, <laughs> confused. Uh, <laughs> so, but do you realize the power of your words? Your words are literally influencing the mole molecular structure of your water, the water in your body. That's the power of words. How many times, and I've ca caught myself doing this, where, when, especially when I was working in corporate America, and people would call me, and like, it'd be my boss calling, and I was like, oh, oh yes. Did I mess up? What did I do? Like all the negative thoughts that are going through my head are like, I can't believe I did that. Oh, you're so stupid, right? The thoughts that are going through our head, look at what I'm creating in my body by saying that. And instead, 
or if you're beating yourself up after another interview where you didn't get the job, right? If you beat yourself up, you're actually worsening the impact in your body. And you're actually then, what you're also doing, is creating that pathway in your brain to think, interviews beat myself up, interviews beat myself up, so I'm gonna beat myself up before the interviews and just go in the interview already beat up, emotionally, right? That's the power of words. And so, and this is where, this is why when people talk about affirmation, and about you speaking words of life into your life, this is why. The one thing that you guys can take out of here, one very practical application that you can start doing, is start writing down words of affirmation for you in the interview process. So something like that, um, I'm a great interviewer. I communicate well with people. People want to employ me because I have skills that can help this company. Or something like that, write words like that. And then before you go on your interview, repeat them. Repeat them to yourself as often as you want. Napoleon Hill, the guy who spent for 20 years studying all the richest men in America, because at that time it was only men uh, who were running businesses, what he noticed is what they did is they wrote down their goals and affirmations, and the very, very successful one of them, they read that to themselves every morning and every <coughs> night. Every morning and every night. And these are the richest men, and they didn't think it was silly. They took it seriously. And they credit that for training their subconscious brain programming to, be, to see opportunities, to see and to live into that, to be that self-fulfilling prophecy for good instead of that self-fulfilling prophecy for destruction. So that's right there, power of words. Go ahead, start using it, and start doing it. Now, big time warning, this one is gonna absolutely rock your world because this one is so easy to do. The power of posture. Um, Amy Cuddy did a TED talk about her research that she had done at Harvard about power poses, low power and high power poses. And the impact, you know, we always think, think confident people have a certain posture, right? What she wanted to do, is it cause and effect? Or is it the other way out? Is it like chicken or egg or you know, egg or chicken? Like which one came first, right? How is it affected? And so she wanted, she tested out to see, does my body posture affect me? And turns out, it does. They tested it out. On, so what they did to test it is on interviews, people who were interviewing for jobs. They would take them aside right before they interviewed and they had identified a few poses, what they called low power poses. And they would make people hold those low power poses for two minutes. And then they would send them on to the interview. And no one knew, the interviewer didn't know that these people got put into these low power poses and they did them covertly so like everyone else didn't see it. And that's the only thing they did. And then they took another group and made them take high power poses. Almost unanimously, the group that did the high power poses got a job offer. And when they asked the interviewers, well, why? You know, because the resumes are very similar. They just said, that person seemed like they were really capable. They seemed like they were a really good fit. They just, they seemed like they were the right person for the job. The, inter the interviewers couldn't say or put something on it. They just said, we just had this feeling that they were the right person for the job. And I'm gonna show you guys some of those poses because this is such an easy way to boost your confidence. This here is low power poses. When you're sitting down, hunched shoulders, um, <coughs> leaning down. Now, how many of you guys, when you go to an interview, you sit down and then you go <laughs> but Let's be realistic, like almost all of us, doctor's office, what do we do? Waiting in line at the grocery store, what do we do? Basically, we're in a low power pose, and what that does, this pose, these poses, or any poses like this where you're constricting your space and making yourself look smaller, you're actually telling your brain to start producing stress. You're actually influencing your brain, your brain is influencing your hormone production by that pose. And so the people who took on these poses before going in, they like held them for about two minutes or so, when they went in, whether they realize it or not, their bodies were naturally more stressed out. Now stress, who stress has tremendous impact on our body. So like I told you, we get like 16 hard drives worth of data thrown at us every day. And we can't process them all. So our subconscious mind decides, is processes it and it tells us, oh, notice this, 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 and this, right? When you add stress into the picture, what happens is instead of like seeing the full 360, the 180 degree, I guess, because you can't see 360, um, 180 degree, you only see seven degrees because you're under stress. So it becomes even more selective. 
That's why at crime scene reports, so many times the eyewitness reports are so different because of that stress. So now if you are going into an interview having taken on a low power pose and your brain is stressed, your brain is not processing at its full capacity. You're not noticing signals at the full capacity. And because you've been trained to be in that low power pose, you're probably gonna be standing in that, sitting in that low power pose during your interview as well and sending that subconscious signal of, I'm not confident. And women, especially women, because women, we are like influenced by society when we, and this is like, I noticed this so true in corporate America, is when we come into a boardroom meeting, we automatically take up as little space as possible. You know, if, you know I and I saw this in me, like I'd have my papers and if a guy came in the room, I'd be like, oh, oh, sorry. I'm not saying the word sorry. Cut that out of our vocabulary, right? And guys, they come into a meeting and they're just like, I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. Boom, expansive. So women especially be extra careful because we tend to do these poses a lot more often. But now instead, high power poses. These are the poses, these poses, taking on these poses actually gets your brain to start producing testosterone. How crazy is that? And testosterone is linked to confidence. You guys. A, th a simple thing as before you get into an interview, go to the restroom, do the Wonder Woman pose, and stay like that for two minutes. Literally, I mean, who cares if you do the restroom for two minutes? You know, like you might be applying makeup. Who knows, right? You know, do or, or guys, I don't know. You know, like Superman pose. Superman pose. There you go. Superman. There you go. Superman. Oh uh, wait, no, but who's Superman? Like? No, no. Oh, he does that too. Okay, <laughs> there you go. See, or high power poses when you're speaking, something like this, leaning in. That's a high power pose. This right here, I mean, you guys, remember Amy Cuddy when she did her research? This was the only differentiator between the people who got the job and who didn't. Right there. This, you need to start applying this before you go to interviews. And you know what? What I tell my clients to do is before, when they're doing their affirmations in the morning, they're looking in the mirror, go ahead and assume this pose. Why not? You're saying the affirmations and your brain is actually producing hormones to increase your confidence. You're like, it's a double whammy on your subconscious mind. Right there. So then imagine doing, you know, sometimes, even like when you're doing something, right, if you're frustrated, you're just like, oh, I can't do this. So sometimes when you're going through the interview prep, you're frustrated, because you're like, ah. <coughs> do that during a high power, high power pose. In high power sales calls, and especially in sales training, they tell people, even when you're on the phone with a client, do a high power pose. And if you're sitting down, one of the options, can I borrow this chair real quick? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> so, when you're sitting down, the, one of the, uh, the poses that are most helpful, feet up, <laughs> and then pose. hands back. And this actually helps you with confidence. So if you're on a phone call, if it's a phone interview, why not? Get comfortable. <laughs> why not? If it, cause that, because remember you guys. Oh, thank you so much. Applause, <laughs> applause. <laughs> <laughs> because remember, your confidence, even if it's a phone interview, your tone of voice is still influencing 38% of your communication. And if 55% of your communication is that nonverbal in your body posture, and you can use your body posture to influence your tone to then match your words, and it's a simple thing as standing up with your hands on your hips. Why not? Use this to your advantage. Test it out. Try it out. And the thing, the reason why I mentioned the thing with the phone is that Amy Cuddy did an additional study after that. Because when they first did the study, they didn't study with the phones. And afterwards, they did a study with the phones. And that's what they found, that the use of smartphones, of the, any small electronic device, causes you to assume a low power pose. So be very careful when you're using a smartphone if you're going on an interview. You might have to go like this and look weird, but at least your shoulders are back, right? You're not hunched down. So keep in mind that. All right, so one of the things that I wanted to do was actually get you guys to get up and get into that power pose. Do um, you guys want to? Yes. Yes? All right, everyone get up. <laughs> I know it's gonna be a bit tough because you know, we're like all over the place. So. Ready? I'm gonna, we're gonna do it just for like 30 seconds. And by the way, smiling, 
Okay, go ahead and let's get into a power pose. You can put your hands up. You can put your hands on your, you know, if, if, you're, if you're worried about your armpits. <laughs> Keep it to one one. <laughs> and so while we're doing this, I'll talk. Oh, hit the start. So we'll just do that, and I'll talk while we're doing this. Another thing to do is smiling. The act of smiling actually get, causes your brain to start producing dopamine. And so, and the act of smiling is also one of the best ways to look approachable and friendly on an interview or just in general when networking. So if you're having a hard time smiling, what you can do is you can actually put a pencil. Amy Cuddy did a study as well. You could have put a pencil in your mouth and just the physical act of having the pencil, because it like forces a little grin, <laughs> it will get your brain to start producing dopamine. And this is a really handy tool, you guys, because once again, when you're going on interviews, your conscious mind is focusing on so many things. Why not train your subconscious mind to have these power tools working in your benefit? All right, so that's 45 seconds. We're good. Thank you, guys. Woo! Yeah. Love it. Love, love it. All right. And then the very last, the, the other tool. So, so we've gotten two techniques so far. First, the power of your words. Power of your words, affirmations. And it's repeat. You can't say, I'm going to do affirmations once, and it's fixed. I'm good. That's not the way it works because, remember, your subconscious patterns, they're patterns and habits for a reason because they've been there a lot. So if you, have to, if you want to break a habit, you have to use, work that new habit for a while. So there's, you know, the study that, some study says it takes 21 days to form a new habit and it takes like 66 days to solidify that new habit. So start that habit of the words of affirmation. Start that habit of every single day. I mean, that's what I do. I created my own planner. And so in my planner, every single morning, I have I write down three things I'm grateful for, and on my side, I have my affirmations that I write down every single day. I write down three things I'm brilliant at. My coach challenged me to do it, and I did it. And so every single day, do that. That's the power of your words. And the second takeaway, backed by research, you guys, power of your posture. Your body language influences your confidence. Mm -hmm. Your body language influences your tone of voice. And you want to get that working in your favor. So start adapting the high power poses right before interviews, while preparing for interviews, because then maybe it's going to make you love preparing for interviews more. You never know. Go ahead and do it. Boom. And then it's the power of visualization. So what happens is all of these things, all this repetitive stuff, it's to get your brain to believe the new belief. Your subconscious brain and your unconscious brain, they need to believe it like deep, deep, deep down. And so what visualization does, it helps your brain really believe it. And so uh, someone once said, when you've been doing things the wrong way, when you start doing them the right way, it'll feel wrong because you're accustomed to the wrong way. And so same thing with the thought patterns that you have in your brain. When you first start writing down the affirmations, when you first start doing the stuff to say, no, I am confident, or I got this, this is me, your brain's gonna say, ah, uh, I have 30 years of history to prove it is not. So you have to get your brain to believe it. And that's the power of visualization. Now, um, my, my coach spoke at the Billion Dollar Roundtable in Chicago last year, along with Richard Branson and another lady, and I forgot her name, but she had talked about, you know, one of the questions they had asked her is, what do you credit your success to? And she goes, well, I do this cheesy thing um, I, I have a vision board, and I visualize, and I think that's really helped me. She has a billion dollar company, right? And so um, my coach, when he got up, he goes, oh, isn't she so cheesy? But she's right. She's right. She's using methods that successful people throughout the ages have known. The power of visualization. Visualization is basically creating a video in your head to be able to get your brain to believe that. And sometimes our brain needs to be believed because the information we receive, the way my friend did, he kept getting information telling him he's stupid. That wasn't the truth. So he had to reprogram his brain to say, I'm not stupid, I'm smart. I mean, he has clients who pay him $10,000 a month to do their advertising, right? Like, he's smart, he's got this, he's good. But for most of his life, he grew up thinking he was stupid. That's, I mean, and the power of visualization. One of my friends, his name is Greg Walker. He actually just came out with a book called um, Dream to Grow Rich. And so he grew up in Ohio. He was born to a family of 15 kids. His parents were drug addicts. And then when he was really young, his father killed his mom. So now all of a sudden, all the kids got thrown into the foster system. And he was one of the younger one of the kids. 
So I mean, he remembers like going to the river and fishing, like getting finding worms to create a can of worms and then go to fishermen and sell it as bait to have money for him to be able to eat. Like that's how bad it was. And when he started high school, the principal actually came up to him and said, you're a walker. You should just flunk out now because all of your siblings, they dropped out too. And he almost dropped out had it not been for a wealthy businessman who had come in one day, noticed him, the teachers had talked about him, and that wealthy businessman created a mentorship group where he, that guy or one of the guys in his companies would come once a month and mentor the kids. And that changed his life. That wealthy businessman was the founder of Arby's. And so my friend Greg was mentored by him and now he is a multimillionaire, owns I don't know how many subways and Arby's stores. But he used the power of visualization because his brain, all he had known, I mean all of his siblings are either dead, homeless, or in prison. And he's the only one of his siblings who has you know, a job, much less money, right? But he used the power of visualization because the video in his head had always said, it's not possible, it's not possible, this is your life. And so he had to train his brain to say, no, that's not true, this is true. So same thing with you guys. You need to use the power of visualization. So what I'm gonna do is call the game ready. My coach does these with all of his athletic clients right before they're about to start a game. And so I'm gonna walk you through it and um, after I walk you through it, then I'll give you guys the steps because you guys can give yourself a game ready right before you go into any interview. So what I want you guys to do is just breathe in and out. <sighs> Breathing in and out helps you clear your mind. Breathe in and out again. And by the way, just a random thing, when you start breathing faster, when you're telling your brain as you're sending it signals that you're stressed out, so breathing in, and out at a calm, steady rate is telling your brain to stay calm. Now I want you to close your eyes. And everyone close your eyes. And I'm going to close my eyes too. All right. Now I want you to think of three things that you're grateful for. Just think three things that you're grateful for. It could be people. It could be a feeling. It could be the chocolates I got and the water bottle I got. Whatever it is. Three things that you're grateful for. Now once you think of those three things, Imagine that you are in this beautiful place of nature. You can choose whatever place of nature you want. It could be a lush waterfall, maybe a steep cliff, ocean, maybe forest, whatever it is. Just imagine you're in this beautiful place of nature and look around and just admire how beautiful it is. Admire just every single aspect of it and just smile and allow yourself to be just completely in awe <sighs> how beautiful this place is. And now while you're looking around, you see a gate. It could be whatever gate. It could be raw iron. Maybe it's a wooden. Whatever gate it is, go to that gate and open the gate. Now as soon as you step over, all of a sudden now, you are in an interview room. It's you. There's a table. There are three people in front of you. Imagine yourself talking to them. Imagine them asking you questions, and you're responding by confidence. And imagine as you're talking to them, imagine they're smiling at you. They're excited. They're like, oh, tell me more. That's awesome. Now imagine if you finish talking with them, and they shake your hand and say, oh, we're definitely going to be giving you a call. And as you walk out of that room, you walk back into that place of nature. Now, when you're in that place of nature, feel free to jump around and dance around and scream and go, yeah, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that was amazing, right? Let go of your emotions in that place of nature. Just completely celebrate. Now, while you're celebrating, you see right next to you is a glass of cool water. You pick up that glass, you take a sip. <sighs> water's so delicious. Take another sip, and then you open your eyes. Now imagine, what is your emotional state now? How do you feel now? This right here is a process that you can use to prepare for interviews. You can imagine when you're walking in, so the first, the first part is take calming breaths. Then after you take calming breaths, you decide, <clears throat> what am I grateful for? You go into a place of nature, that way 
you know, you're calm, you're relaxed, you're appreciative, and then you walk into the video, basically that video reel of what it is that you want to accomplish. And so that can change each time depending on what interview are you going in. Is it a phone interview? So, you know, maybe you imagine yourself with your feet up on the desk while you're talking on the phone, right? Whatever it is. And the power of that is it's teaching your brain that that is truth. It is convincing your brain that that is what is going to happen. And so when you then actually show up for game day, you're ready. That's what he said. He calls it your game ready. Your brain, your subconscious brain has been programmed to assume best possible outcome. I'm going to react on my best instead of I'm going to react with stress. So that one right there, power visualization, that's one thing you guys can do before e every time before you go into your game readies. I mean, before you go into your interviews, your game readies. And like, yes, he uses this NFL clients, Major League Baseball, golf, Army Rangers, and Navy SEALs as well, actually, are the program that he uses just got um, last year, started, got sent out to all of the armed forces through the Pentagon. But this is, you guys, this is the thing I want to leave you with. Interviews are communication. And your communication, only 7% of it is what your conscious effort is. 93% of your communication is influenced by your subconscious mind. And you have learned three tips and three techniques that you can get your subconscious mind to start aligning with your conscious mind with your words. The power of your words, your affirmations, the power of your body posture, which not only affects your subconscious mind, but physically affects your body, and then also the power of visualization. And so that right there, you guys, super powerful, start applying, and then that's gonna prepare you to be able to ace that interview. Any questions? Not just me. <laughs> questions, yeah. Um, what's the ideal body language for um, you know, doing the interview? Ooh, yes, the ideal body, body language, conf confident, right? And so uh, when you're sitting down, <coughs> Yes. Well, you guys won't be able to see it, but here, let me, sitting down, take up the space. So women, try as much as possible not to cross your feet, um, if you can. If you're wearing a skirt, understandable, or, you know, do the princess pose, where you have, like, yeah, I, I, I don't want to fall. <laughs> but take up the full space. So shoulders back. If there's armchairs, take up the full space. Oh, and one really important thing that I found really helpful for me, thank you is mirroring. So what happens is usually when you're really in-depth in conversation with someone, with a friend, you'll notice that you'll start imitating them. Like if they're putting their hands here, you'll, you'll start doing that without realizing it. And that's mirroring. That's when someone has a connection and there's a trust. And so what you can do when you're on interviews to be able to create that connection, or at least, a, at least the visual appearance of that connection, is if your interviewers have a certain body language, you assume that body language as well. So that's what I did when I would, so when I first started working at Raytheon, I was only 20, I was an, in, an intern for two years, but I was like basically there 30 hours a week. And within the first three weeks in my job, I was already interacting with the CEO, the CFO, et cetera. So when I walked into the boardroom, what I did is I looked around and said, okay, what's everyone else doing? And I saw that the guys were like, Oh, so I'm like, oh, <laughs> why not, right? Mirroring helps people, they, they assume that you're more like them. So if you mirror them in body posture as well, then they'll assume more, they'll have that better connection with you. Yes? What if their body posture is like? Then don't do that. Okay. Oh, no, no. If their body posture is a low body posture, uh, low power pose, no. No, you assume control. But it's, it's definitely, if there's handles, arms there. Um, if there are no handles, I guess maybe this, but always shoulders back, confident. And every now and then, during the interview, just stop and think in your head, I'm confident, and remind yourself. Shoulders back. So yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you exert confidence or be confident without looking arrogant? Ooh, yes. It's showing confidence through your body posture it's always confidence. Arrogance comes into play more into the way you treat other people. So like, it's, it's very slight, but like, let's say if you're confident, you're walking into a room and you know, or there's someone behind you, hold the door and say, enter. 
for an arrogant person just be like, you know? It's just that. So it's just, it's confident. It's, there's, it's a very slight difference. But arrogance, people usually aren't empathetic or caring. And so you show that confidence so with that caring that's in there. But what about in terms of when you're selling yourself about your skills or something? And rather than seem, seeming pompous or um, arrogant, like how, how do you... It. I don't know right. how to articulate the question. No, 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 I know what you're saying. How can you brag about yourself without bragging? Without bragging. Yeah. Yes, yes, great, great question. Um, so one of the ways to do it is instead of saying, well, I have great leadership skills or I have something, give an example of something that you have done that displayed those skills. Because then you're telling a story, and they'll understand from the story. They'll, they'll read it the way, oh, he's got this, this, and this skills without you saying, well, I'm really good at getting people to do what I tell them to. You know, there's, there's that difference. Okay. Always tell the story. One of the things that, that I use, you know, when people come up to me and say, well, why should I hire you instead of X and Y, Z? I tell them, honestly, if you ask me, I don't know. If you ask my clients, my clients will say X, Y, Z or X, Y, Z. And all of a sudden, it's not me saying it, it's someone else saying it. So same thing with story. A story is a way of showing how you did it instead of saying you did it. So th that's a great question. Okay. Great question. There was a question back there. Yeah. Uh, most of my life, uh, <laughs> uh, just subconsciously, most of my life, but especially more since 2012. That's when I really started deep diving into all of these, diff all this different research, and realizing how much of it I did. So, like the example I gave about mirroring, I wasn't aware. Just me naturally, one of my one of my natural talents is I'm I like I'm very empathetic with people. So if I have one on one conversations with people, like I found if they're coughing, I'm gonna start coughing. And it's not because I'm tr I want to. I it's it just I like connecting to people at that level. And so I noticed that those are things that I did. And the the reason why in 2012 specifically is that year. I mean, for the longest time, you guys, I thought I was gonna go to corporate America, become CFO, CEO. Done. Like I'm gonna rule Raytheon, um, and then in 2012 we had. That's when the Great Recession finally hit us because we were on you know government budget, so everything's always a lag behind. And we had two rounds of layoffs. I got moved into a new position. We had three reorganizations within that position, and within eight months, I became the most senior member of my team. And we had reports that were being sent to our French counterparts, um, to Raytheon corporate, to everything. And I. That's when I like. At first, I was demoralized. At first, I hated my job. I was like, I don't want to go to work. I'd wait to the last minute possible to roll out of bed and go to work. And then I started thinking, wait a second, wait a second. Like, what's going on? This isn't me. And so that's when I started looking into this and realizing, oh my goodness, here are the steps that I'd been using that were successful. I'm out of that. Now let me go in that. And then that's especially more so when um, I started coaching a lot of my current, my employees, my, employees, my colleagues. Um, and then decided eventually I'm going to launch my own company. So there were two more questions, I think. Yeah. Oh yes. You know what? For me, I found the less I think about it, the more natural it becomes. And and this is why. So to me, this is the kind of person I was. You know, when I when I interviewed, like. I'd smile, and if something funny was funny, I laughed, I giggled. Like, I giggled at work, you guys. I did, I did, I was, you know, girly. And then, afterwards, I just continued giving the answer. Um, gosh, let me, let me, hold on, let me think of a better way of giving that answer, because the best answer I find is I don't think about it too much, because if you think about it too much, then you tend to come off very mechanical and very not authentic, because you're overthinking. If you're just, this is, I'm gonna come up here, and if something seems natural, if you're gonna laugh at something, laugh. You know, uh, humor is always great in an, in an interview. To me, what I would do, to my, to my advantage, because I'm a female, when I'd walk in, you know, I'd compliment someone on the way they're dressed, whether they're man or woman, because men, men, this is one of the, because of our preconceptions of feminine and masculine, if a female compliments you, men are like, cool. You know, because they're accustomed to females complimenting. If a man compliments you, I don't know, in the workforce, at first it's sort of like, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, that's one thing that I would do, is, you know, I'd compliment people if it was authentic. 
don't compliment people just to piss off. That's not a real compliment. No. No. Um, that's really the best answer I have. Don't think about it too much. Just be yourself. And then you had a question? Um, so something you noticed in the interviews, they asked you, like, what is one of the reasons you didn't like to quit? So how do you answer that question? Only were you mentioning, like, somebody that you wouldn't want to hire? Hmm. Well, don't say one of my weaknesses is that urges to kill people. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was, like, really bad humor, but, like, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, that requires some, some thought ahead of time. Like really think about what is one of your weaknesses. And do not think I'm perfectionist. That's the most overused weakness. Don't use that. Because that's sort of like a backhand compliment to yourself. Say, I'm such a perfectionist. Like, I'm so good. I have a hard time trying not to be good. Um, <laughs> so really think about a weakness. Like for me, um, when people talk with me, one of my biggest weaknesses in my business is marketing myself. And for talking about myself without seeming like braggy, right? And but more so because I'm inundated so much with like marketing emails, whenever I see like flowery talk, I'm just like, like I don't want to do that, right? So I just tell people, look, this this is a place I'm, you know, one of my weaknesses, and these are the steps I'm taking to fix it. So if you show that you have a weakness and you're working to fix it, what you're sending, the clear signal you're telling them is, I'm aware of my flaws. I'm aware that I'm not perfect. I'm willing to admit to that, but I'm also willing to work it. And I've already started working it. So if you, you're showing as a person, you're showing up then as a person who's willing to learn, who's teachable, and they're thinking, ah, that might be a person we want on our team because they're a person who's flexible and teachable. So that's the way I'd approach it. Just be honest about whatever that weakness is. If you have maybe two or three weaknesses and one of them you're embarrassed, don't say the one you're embarrassed about. Say the, say the other one. But talk about what are you doing, what are you working to improve that weakness. So, yeah. Any other questions? So this uh, power of like visualizing things, do you find mm -hmm. this common with a lot of these successful CEOs and people that you work with? Yes, mm -hmm. hands down. When you talk with them, that's one of the things that they'll talk about. And so, I mean, much more CEOs, um, because of because of the way your brain works, C, like CFOs tend to be a lot more analytical <coughs> and stuff, but the biggest way you'll know whether they believe in it or not is you ask them what books they're reading, and, or what books they would recommend to someone starting out. Maybe that's a question you would ask on an interview. And if you want me to work at your company, what books should you recommend that I read? Because one of the big things you'll realize is, depending on the books that they read and the authors they read, it will tell you whether or how much they're influenced by visualization or not. But definitely Steve Jobs, big believer in visualization. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that, do, that run multi-billion dollar companies, Richard Branson, big time. Do you have a favorite book, maybe? Like Ooh, <laughs> I love books. I love books. Okay, the absolute book that I think everyone should read, hands down, <laughs> but The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Yeah, I read that five times. Yes. The first time I read that, I literally cried. It's amazing. The Alchemist. It's absolutely brilliant and amazing. And after you read that, then read um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. That's, that's his seminal work. This is the guy who for 20 years studied all the richest men in the U.S. His absolute seminal work. I'd highly recommend you read that. And then... I read a lot, so I have a lot of favorite books. Um, those two, absolutely, absolutely. And then one book that I have found very impactful in my life is The 80-20 Principle by Richard Koch. It talks about this principle of 80% of your results are created by 20% of your input. And this is based on studies that were done back in the 1800s by Vincent Pareto. This study and this, the, the theory that he talks about that that was behind the Japanese Industrial Revolution, the American Industrial Revolution, anyone in the computer, computing world, that's what they would use to speed up the processes of all of our hard drives, et cetera, so the 80-20 principle. And Richard Koch, the way he writes it, he shows how it applies to business and life. So, those books. Yes? Um, I just have one book also to recommend, is Pleasance by Amy Cuddy. There you go, yeah. She, yeah, it's <laughs> really good about, it just goes deeper into posture and like confidence and 
There you go. There you go. Done. <coughs> yeah. What was the name of the book by Napoleon Hill? Think and Grow Rich. And even though the concepts, you know, you it's about he talks about, about you know attaining wealth, <coughs> what it is is he's talking about the principles of your subconscious mind <coughs> and how to apply them to attain a goal. <coughs> so you can change it to whatever goal you want. So yeah, if you guys want any more information, I'm available at SylviaCarrasco.com and across all social media. And I know it's, oh, 116, we're good on time. We're really good. I mean, if anyone has, okay, we, we got time then. If anyone has any other questions, go ahead and ask. And if not, I'm, I'll be here for a little bit. You can feel free to come up and talk and ask questions. So, yeah. Thank you. You guys are awesome to be here on a Friday. Would you be able to forward it to everyone? Perfect. You'll forward it to everyone. You're welcome. You're welcome.